Boom, shalom. I wish the music had played 10 seconds longer, but the story of my life, it didn't. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, stop this. Stop, God damn it! Oh, it's already going all wrong today with the interwebs and the internet. But ladies and gentlemen, it's going to go right from now on. Oh, oh my payas! My payas fell off. What the hell? God damn it! What a day! This is every, good pay at these days. You, you, you know you can't. Yeah, I, I pay so much for the payas, you know. And I'm, I try to be pious, man, in my payas. Hey, but. Anyway, let me let me just make sure that people can hear you. We have a very special guest in the neighborhood. Let's make you nice and loud, like, just like you are when you get to sing on Broadway, playing Amos in Chicago or, or on tour when you do that. We're talking, or we'll be talking, to an actor. His name, where the hell are my notes? Here they are. He made his Broadway debut as Amos in Chicago all the way back in 2001, and he's been on Broadway, in the show, and on tour for many, many years. He even did it in Washington, D.C., and they gave him, uh, he was nominated for a Helen Hayes Award. For doing that. Helen Hayes herself threw herself at him, uh, but he was married, and he said, thank you very much, you're a nice lady. He he's, he's has regional credits at Jiva, Williamstown Theatre Festival, the American Repertory Theatre, Portland Stage, and the studio theater, as we said, the studio theater in Washington, D.C. You've seen him on TV, in such programs as 30 Rock and Flight of the Concords. I want to hear all about that. But the reason we're having him on this program today, on the Dave's Gone By show, with me stepping in here, Rabbi Saul Solomon, is that he wrote the lyrics for a new musical called The Glorious Death of Comrade What's-His-Name. That is going to be getting an industry uh, showing a reading, if you will, this coming uh, January 20th. Wait, what the hell is today? Today's the 18th night. It's Monday. It's Monday night at 54 below at 9.30 in the evening. So first of all, first and foremost, we want to welcome to the neighborhood Shalom to Ray Bokur. Am I, I'm, first of all, am I pronouncing that? Shalom yes. to you? Yes? Shalom, you pronounced perfectly. Yay! I did something perfectly for once. I can't even pronounce Hebrew right. That, that's the, the luck of my draw. But Ray Bokur. So let me ask you, and, I'm, and I, I say this with some trepidation, is that kind of an Arab name? Oh, it's a uh, Hebrew name. It's, I didn't realize that you're, sorry, Yidlach. It's, uh, that's a good word for it, I guess. I, 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 uh, I've never heard that word, actually. I'm, I'm trying to, to make you still a little bit louder. If you could talk a little bit. We, we all want oh, to. Oh, sure. There we go. This? Oh, God, there I, Yeah. What if I do this? Is this better? Much better. Thank you. Thank you for stop, uh, stop talking through the blanket and, and, and just yeah. let your mouth open up there. This is good. I so, thought a blanket would make my voice warmer, but no. It, 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 it gives you more fiber in your diet. I don't even know what the hell that means. But, but, <laughs> and my payas is still screwed up. I don't know what the hell's going on today. So, so, but no, no, this is, this is important stuff. So Mazel Tov, so you, you are a, a Yidlach. What is your Hebrew name? Yes, Bohur. Uh, it's actually uh, Hebrew via Iran, where my father uh, grew up uh, an Iranian Jew and came to this country in 1948 and uh, set up a business and married a woman and got married and had a bunch of kids. Wait, 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 time out, fantastic, Mazel Tov. When you say he left in 1948, was that was it connected at all to uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the birth of Israel that year, or just that happened to be the year he left? This was 1948, yeah. and uh, yeah, he moved, uh, I think he was 18, and uh, their family had a business in Tehran, and they wanted him to uh, go scope out all the new goods in uh, the United States. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So how many brothers and sisters do you have? You mentioned it was a big family. I'm, yeah, I'm the baby of five kids. Mazel. Are any of them in the, in the showbiz like you are? Um, my brother is a fantastic bass player, and he's living on the West Coast playing bass quite a lot, and he's a, just a great musician. Uh, the others are, uh, I have a brother who's a drummer, but his, his uh, day job is he's uh, worked for uh, various companies that help uh, put things up on the space shuttle. You know, there's a TESS uh, mission that's out there now called TESS. I forget what it's called, but it has something to do with uh, searching for exoplanets. So he has helped build a camera that uh, is discovering many other planets out there. What the hell is an exoplanet? 
Is it like Japan? Well, it's not an ego planet. I guess it's the farther away, very far away, outside of our solar system or something. I already hear the Jewish humor in Ray Bokor. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, but by the way, and what's funny is I asked for your Hebrew that's name. A great compliment, and I thank you. Well, it is. What? But your yeah. first, your first name? Were you? What was it? What is your uh, Hebrew first name? Uh, my name is my middle name is uh, Abraham. Oh. Yeah. So I just go by Abraham because it's easier for people. But that was your middle name. Oh, so it, yeah. it's like when we're called up to the Torah at your bar mitzvah, you were. Yeah, I got some uh, frustrating news there. I wasn't bar mitzvahed uh, very consciously. I was, uh, when I was 13, actually, my father's tradition with the older brothers was to take everybody, to take the boys back to uh, Tehran, meet the family there. My grandfather was, uh, I'm going to say, kind of a lay rabbi, if you will, and he would uh, perform these ceremonies in the synagogue over there. And when I was 13, the revolution was happening, and they said, you know what, let's not go. Uh, my mother might have been uh, uh, conscripted into the army and uh, just wouldn't have been good. So we decided not to do it. I wound up not having a bar mitzvah. But then, when I was 16, I went uh, and visited the the, uh, the Wailing Wall. And uh, without my knowing what was going on, my father grabbed me and he found some uh, rabbi and we walked into the side uh, little room of uh, one of these things and uh, they said, repeat after me. Which I did, and uh, and he said, "Congratulations, to your bar mitzvah." Mazel, mazel tov. Yeah, very let's call it a mystical kind of uh, ceremony that I enjoyed very much. And then uh, before I knew it, it was all over, and I didn't have to do all of that practicing that all the American Jewish boys that I knew were doing. Well, let me tell you, I didn't have my bris until I was forty. That was oh, much worse. I'm trying to tell you this. <laughs> But what is being Jewish? I mean, we will have other, but leave me. We'll talk about your show. We'll talk about Chicago. But what does being Jewish mean to you, if anything? Is it just cultural? Is there a religious component still? For you? What do you feel? Oh, you know, I can tell you uh, with great sincerity, I uh, really enjoyed going to uh, synagogue when I uh, Although I have to say there was one that was conducted almost entirely in Hebrew. I didn't know what was going on. Very crowded and uh, not too much fun. But then we, my father said, you know, let's go someplace where we can understand what the rabbi is saying. And uh, I started to really like that. That was nice, and it always gave me the time to sit and think about the, you know, bigger philosophical issues. As I got older, um, I discovered uh, other philosophies in uh, Buddhism. And I started to uh, practice Buddhism, and uh, I could consider myself very much. Uh, appreciative of everything I, I uh, learned and I have uh, met other uh, rabbis that I've uh, had long, wonderful discussions with who I just adore so uh, I feel like it's all kind of, you know, uh, we have so many areas of, of uh, we're all human so we all have so many areas of Speak for yourself. activity. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I, I commute on the Long Island Railroad, I'm not all human. I remember taking a subway car. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm talking about we all do me and the people we know. Oh, yeah, just us. Absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah. You remember seeing, seeing me eat soup? Uh, there's already uh, not necessarily a, a human component to the way I have food. <laughs> but I want to ask Ray Bokor also uh, a question because you are of Iranian extraction. And your family, you probably still a family. What is something, since we're so afraid now that we might get into a war with that fish in the country, what, what is something that we should know about Iran that your family could tell us that we should know that either should allay our fears or make them worse? <laughs> Nothing I can tell you would uh, uh, make you dislike the Iranian people. I adore my cultural uh, heritage and my old. In 1978 and 79, so many, you know, my father brought over all his family, thank God, and, uh, you know, helped them set up here in the United States, and that, I was, was I 13? Yeah, uh, 14, and I started to get to know all my cousins and my uh, aunts and uncles, and uh, so it wasn't uh, the first time I didn't grow up with it exactly, but then all of a sudden we were at all these parties with all these Persian speaking relatives and hearing 
hearing me laughing and hearing me, you know, crying about what they want in their country. And so they're a beautiful, passionate bunch of people that I've got to know. But like you say, you know, I'm sure if you got on the, uh, the train in Iran, you'd encounter some people who maybe were less than enjoyable to be around. Yeah. I, I would, if I were dressed like this, I would not, uh, they wouldn't let me off the train. They'd they be using my blood to grease the wheels, I believe. <laughs> no, it's like Actually, that happens now. Not man. everybody is, you know, the people everywhere, not everyone is, uh, is uh, saint all the time. But um, the, it, the generosity uh, and the, uh, the kindness and, and the uh, willingness to, to put yourself out for someone else is, is just a beautiful thing. And of course, the humor is very, very, I mean, we were Jews, but I'm going to say even Iranian Jews have Jewish humor. Oh my God. What is there a, can you tell us an Iranian Jewish joke? You know English. something? Yeah. Oh my God. This one is not perfect for it because it's a visual joke. That <laughs> also needs an explanation. But I'm going to try. Okay, I can act together if you need. Let me know. Yeah, yeah, please, please. There's a, 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 a head gesture that is typical in Iran where they say, and it's like saying no, but with a little more joy in your in your in your thing. And you kind of drop your head and you shake your head left to right, and you say, bah, bah, bah. and that means, oh, delicious, or oh, I love it. Oh. And so the joke is, is a, the, the Iranian mouse trap is a, bl a curved blade pointed up, and you put the cheese on one side. The mouse comes over and eats the cheese and says, bah, 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 and he rubs his neck across the plate, you see. It's really quite funny visually if you already know bah, bah, bah. Ah, okay. I'm, I'm sensing it. I'll, I'll, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it's not funny now. I don't know if, if Don Rickles could make a go of that one. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe there's some mice fans out there. I don't want to offend any of them. Please know that uh, I love mice. Could be. I want to kill them. We're talking, by the way, with Ray Bohur, and we want to talk now. Let's talk some theater. Let's, or, or even, we'll start with music, because you were going to be a musician, essentially, right? Right. I was going to be a jazz musician. I went to New England Conservatory and majored in jazz, uh, initially jazz guitar, and then jazz composition. And around about the end of that, somebody said, hey, uh, you should write music for a show. And I walked into a theater and I went, what people? <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, it's just, uh, it catches all of us at one time or another. Where we, we're not even paying attention. And then we walk into our actors and we see them on stage where something happens and it's like uh, other people, oh, this is good. You know, then they go see a, a Broadway show, they go home, don't even that. And then, but others of us, we go in like, I want to be here forever. You know? Yes. If I could live on this stage, on this set, if I could be with these people, uh, go out, right. you know, to Sardis at uh, twelve o'clock at night with these folks. This is this is it. So exactly what happened to me. Yeah. Well, what, what, what can you even pinpoint that moment when you when you're so like when it hit you, when it struck you? Oh yeah, honestly, oh, I can tell you. I was uh, asked to write music for a yes. show that some students were doing, and I walked into the theater, and one of the actors is now a, a very famous, very successful actor named David Costable, and he was so funny, and so he made it look easy and incredibly fun, and I kind of got it into my head that, oh, I could do that, and then I started to act, I auditioned for something, and I realized, this is not easy. But it is incredibly fun. And then I just started working on it really hard. But he was, uh, he was great in the show, and we were you know, still friends and to this day, and he's still inspiring me in a lot of ways. Well, hold on, hold on. I do, I do want to ask, like, this was high school. What age were you at this point? Uh, oh, sorry, this was college. College, uh, right. And uh, yeah, because yeah. I was also, at the same time as the conservatory, I was also at Tufts University. And uh, so while I was there, I was uh, they had a great theater program, and uh, that's where David was. And I was... 20, 20 years old. Well, what shows were you in and what parts did you play? If you don't mind my asking, like back then. Uh, oh, back then, yeah. The first show I was ever in was a show called, oh my gosh, Chris Durang's show, The Actor's Nightmare. Oh, okay. And I played Henry Irving, the famous actor. And it's a 
wild, wacky, you know, crazy yeah. thing where a guy wakes up and he's in Hamlet and he doesn't know uh, any of his lines. So, so it was great fun, and uh, uh, I got some laughs for the first time ever in my life. <laughs> I was totally hooked. And uh, uh, yeah, and then uh, what else did I do? We did uh, oh, we did Lysistrata. We did uh, a political play called Sanchez, and we. Uh, I didn't do musicals until I played Groucho in a, um, a Night in Ukraine, which was really fun also. And that taught me a lot. I knew I wow. knew this stuff because I grew up watching Groucho, you know, the Marx Brothers movies. And stuff. Of course. But, so, but uh, it, wasn't a direct, kind of like, it wasn't a direct hit for you. Like suddenly you came out of, of this conservatory or a Tufts and then boom, you started getting acting roles in the real world. And that did not occur or did oh. No. I, I, I took everything I could get, most of which was, you know, for free, uh, or for, you know, here's your bus change or something. Mm -hmm. And that was when I stayed in Boston for a couple of years. I got a job um, selling tickets at the American Repertory Theater, which was fantastic because I got to uh, see a lot of free stuff. Did you, did you know Robert, Island. I'm sorry, uh, sorry, but did you know Robert Brewstein? Was he around? Yeah. Did you learn anything from yeah. him? Oh, everything. I mean, he, uh, the way he ran it, he, he, uh, uh, it was, it was full every night. There were lines out the door. I can tell you because I was uh, in working in the box office. office we turned right. at ten a.m. and there was a line down the down the block for people to see, uh, you know, avant-garde theater and and uh, uh, Philip Glass operas and things like this. Somehow or other. I had been raised to think like, like, oh, people don't go see theater. You know, theater is dying. And he did not make you think that for one second. But now, here's, ideas, yeah. now, here's the question for me. As, as, as someone who performs, you're a performer, of course. You're working yeah, yeah. at American Rep, but you're working in the yeah. box office and you're selling tickets and you're yeah, ushering people. You got to clean the toilet sometime, all that sort of thing, and make sure the lights are working and, and so forth. And then, you know, some yeah. crock in a, in a wheelchair has to be wheeled in and just around. You do all of this, and then these shows are going up, and you're getting to see them, which is a fantastic education. But is there also that, that canker worm gnawing in you? So why am I not being cast? I'm, I'm spending all these hours here. I'm giving them all my time. I'm being paid crap. Why, why can't I get in a friggin' show? How do you do it? Well, yeah. two things. One is uh, I, I, uh, I had done a, a one-man show of my own writing, and I just was, like, doing it. If, if people, if I didn't have a job, I was going to create it. So that was one. And the other one was I was stuck in the hallways upstairs trying to get myself in. And I did. I talked to somebody and I said, I hear you need somebody to play this part in uh, a new Arthur Cuffett play called uh, Road to Nirvana. Okay. It's a very small part. And I uh, said, I, sh I want to audition. And he said, oh, okay. And he walked me down the hall. And then I auditioned and I got it. So I... You know, I had to learn to be brave and walk up to the right people. And, and, and I mean, I did a number of other things for them uh, on stage as well as off. They had a conservatory, and I, they sometimes needed an extra actor for their production, so I would go in and get some education on the side. Well, what, <laughs> and, speaking of on the side, what was the one person show that you were doing on your own scene in and around Boston? Oh, yeah, there was a. Um, there was a uh, well, I'm sorry, I lost you there. I lost the, the, the yeah. It was a show. It was a show called Fly Staff, and it was a series of different characters uh, together by a narrator who was telling the story of one man who was meeting all these characters. So you never actually saw the lead, but you the lead character, but you saw all the people he met. And uh, I read the music to the intellectual kind of connections there between the monologues and. It was crazy because, you know, 40 people on your first night in the house that seats 40. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. That's, uh, believe me, I played 40 seat theaters to six people. It's not a, you know. <laughs> I did that the next night, but opening night, we were back. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was extraordinary because, uh, you know, I have some of your, your friends and more than half of them are your friends and family, and you have to go out there and say, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to believe. This is like, I should be up here. And that was, uh, that changed everything. Like, once I was able to do that, I think it was about uh, two minutes to eight, and I was pacing alone backstage, uh, terrified of my mind. And I thought, well, if they hit it, screw them. I, I, what can I do? And to be able to throw away those fears and to kind of throw 
major turning point for me as a performer, and it got me a lot more brave and able to have fun. So, so yeah, and then I just took yeah. jobs that I could get. And then you, you inched your way closer and closer at some point to New York. You That's just where you're going to go. Yeah, exactly. I went to school, I went to drama school in London because I really did want a, a formal uh, oh. education in acting. And then uh, I was there for three years, and then I, when I came back, uh, I uh, got myself a commercial book or two, which did very well, and then I uh, managed to get myself a legit agent, as they call them, and uh, it wasn't too long after that that I was on my way into Chicago. Well, I mean, bam, just there it is. It's just it's this process, this yeah. natural actor's process of, of, you know, taking tickets in a repertory theater, and then a few years later, boom, there you are on a Broadway stage. Um, do you remember your first audition? for Chicago? Who was there? What did you do? <laughs> I do. I, I can't recall if it was, um, if Walter was at my, Walter the Bobby, the director, was at my first audition or just at the callback. Uh, I think it was the callback because I remember they had given me the opening speech during uh, Funny Honey. And, you know, he's got a little scene with the police guy and then he, he uh, goes crazy, like, why, I can't believe she's done this to me, and he's got a big, long speech, but they only gave me one page, and it was cut off, so I did the speech, and in the middle of it, I just stopped, and they were like, what, what's wrong, and I said, this is all I got, <laughs> yeah, but, okay. right, so the other thing was, uh, you know, they were casting for the tour, and, you know, right. things uh, don't always happen immediately, and I six months went by and I forgot that I had auditioned for Chicago the Musical uh, and when my agent called and he said do you want to spend six months in Chicago I said sure what play and he said no Chicago and I said no I know where what play so uh, finally he explained it to me and I remembered having auditioned and I went out and joined the tour so you were on tour first and then eventually you got to Broadway as well that's right. Right. Which is, which is what happens. They try people out on the road, and then when people cycle out. So who was Amos? Well, Joel Gray was out of it, I assume, by that point. Who was Amos that you took over after at that point? Oh, I don't know if I took over directly from P.J. Benjamin, but he had done it uh, uh, quite a lot. It's a, little, it's a little less, you know, like I would do two weeks and then, you know, cover for, a, for, for somebody's vacation or something. And then, so I was in and out. Uh, there were a few. Amos is hard to keep track of all of them, but uh, probably it was P.J. Benjamin, who was great in it, and who was a sweet guy. But he moved on to do other things, and I uh, wound up becoming their go-to Amos for many years. Now, maybe, maybe we should explain for people who don't remember Chicago, didn't see the movie a hundred times, Amos is yeah. the husband, um, is it, it's Roxy, he's Roxy's husband, right? Or is it That's right. Right, Roxy's husband, he's a schnook, he's a, he's a nothing, he's just kind of, he, he, nobody knows he's there. And he actually sings a song about it. So you get to be the schnooky part in Chicago. What do you bring to it? What What is your thing that, let's say, um, that the guy in the movie, I can't ever remember his name, uh, Char something, right? He's got a three name name. And, and, or, or. Who's that? Who are you looking for? No, who played Amos in the movie? It was. Um, oh, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about, right? I do. The guy yeah, from Tommy. Alan Egan Knight, that guy. Yeah, Talladega Knight, snack fella. What the hell is his goddamn name? <laughs> I can never. You can look it up. No, 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 no. They stay with us. But, but here's the deal. What do you do in that role that is that is particular to Ray Bokur, as opposed to what Joel Gray was doing, as opposed to what this guy we can't remember his damn name is? What is your take on Amos? Well, I don't know if I could uh, reduce it. I don't know if I'd want to, but uh, I, I. Uh, I guess I just try and be myself and be empathetic to not only him, but to the parts of myself that are like him, and trust that the audience is, is more like him than they are these uh, these killers <laughs> that are in the other, you know, the shows about these murderesses and and, uh, and their scheming letters. So in some ways, well, very real ways, he, he represents kind of normal people, many of whom feel unheard and powerless and uh, and abuse. So, uh, if I remember all of that uh, and do it with uh, love and sincerity for for uh, for the audience and uh, for those parts of myself that uh, feel that way, then uh, now I should say quickly that no doubt that is what 
the previous Amoses were also doing. I don't mean to say this is what sure. I did differently, but right. uh, but it comes out through my own through my own filter, through my own experiences, and, and the things that uh, work well on on me and what my you know what my body is. Like if I tried to do what what uh, uh, Joel Gray did, you know, and just copy that, it wouldn't work. So I have to know who I am and and uh, what I'm like, and and then bring that to it. Now, let me ask, speaking of, well, of your real life intersecting, you are a husband and a father, Mazel McGlick, right? Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. But you're also an actor, and an actor who does the, the majority, I would say, of your work on tour in other cities for weeks at a time, you know, or, or two nights in this place and a night here and a night there. How do you balance? Uh, and this is a question, you know, men always get the, the short end of the stick because um, they say, oh, we never, we only ask women. We only ask mothers who are on Broadway or on film. Oh, how can you be away from your family for this long? Or how do you have a life like that when you have children? Uh, yeah. And I'm asking you, who, who has a penis, as far as I know, what is it like for you being a husband or father? Uh, well, I, I'm just guessing. You know, I, I, yeah. I'm assuming that this happened at some point. Yeah. So, but seriously, it, it was, how do you do? Yeah. Um, no, that's a great question. I'm really glad you asked it uh, because, uh, you know, it, yeah, we shouldn't take those things for granted. And, and it wasn't easy. Uh, I'll tell you from, from my wife when I did uh, the musical once, uh, I went out on tour. And at first I said, you know what, honey, they've asked me to audition for this thing. It's a tour. Uh, you know, our daughter is, is four now. I don't want to go away. And she said, you know what? She's four. She hasn't started school yet. Do it. Audition. It's a great part. It's a great, you know. It's a lovely show. show, yeah. It's a lovely show. You should do it. And plus, you're a musician. You get to play. So I said, she said, we'll come with you. And I said, well, that sounds amazing. A year on tour with my family. Let's do it. Yeah. And I auditioned. And then I booked it. And then we looked at each other and we said, we can't do that. Phoebe has to, you know, be here and have a regular place to live and not be carted around from, from week to week. That's how we felt about it. And plus, my wife was just starting uh, uh, her, her uh, second uh, business, uh, act, becoming an acupuncturist. She was going to help Kitty in the tour. And uh, when she was kind of transitioning out of dancing and out of a child and, and uh, starting an acupuncture business. So I said, well, what are we going to do? Because I've already, you know, they're you just said, yes, yeah, counting on you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we just worked it out. We said, you know, uh, we'll come with, with you, be with you for five weeks over the over the uh, holidays, and then the summer we'll be with you. So, okay, now we're down to seven months of me being apart from them. And it wasn't easy, but I would fly in on my day off. I had one day off, usually Monday. I would fly in Sunday night after a show and fly out Tuesday morning, hmm. and I would do that pretty religiously, and it was kind of grueling, but totally worth it. And then, well, you're both um, Buddhist and Jewish, so religiously comes easy to you. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Sorry about that. And that's like that's my third religion. But that is the, um, the routine that you still have to keep up because you're still a father, you're still a husband, you're still a father, and they, you know now they're even they're in school, right? They're they're growing or they. How old yeah, are you? yeah. Now yeah. that she's in school, of course, you know the chance. I, I haven't been going away because, uh, unless it's for you know two weeks or you know some, some short span. But uh, but yeah, it's always hard. I want to be there. I want to be there for every step of her uh, education and her growing up and and uh, just having fun and knowing that she can turn to me. And yeah, those that year was was uh, was rough. But they would come out to me. Uh, quite often for a few days at a time, and then I would go to them. I think the longest I ever went without seeing her was three weeks, and that was and just that was terrible. It was like deeply troubling. But uh, so I'm not in a rush to get out on the tour again unless they come with me. But uh, uh, that's okay. I've been here on you know working in New York, so uh, that's been great. Well, here's the deal. Here's the the, the big question for you because it's not as if. I, 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 please uh, explain this to me. I, you did this in another interview, but I really want to be clear. You get a, a you know, you're a working actor, uh, a character actor, okay? Yes. So you get Broadway role Amos in Chicago. Why not just do that 48 weeks a year, take a couple of weeks <laughs> vacation, and just stay no matter who else is around you? And they, why can they cycle out like that? Why not just take the role of, like people doing Phantom of the Opera? 
Yeah, Madame Geary in there for a hundred friggin' years. You know, nobody was pushing her out off the stage. Why do you cycle in and out? Because then you have to go look for work, and it isn't always easy to find. Well, uh, I think it. Uh, you know, I don't. Uh, I don't press it uh, too much. Uh, if if uh, if they want to go a different direction for a little while, that's cool with me. And I know that uh, we love each other, and we'll come back. Uh, sometimes uh, I. Have often been the one to say, you know what, I'm taking this other gig, so, uh, because I want to mix it up, or, or I have, uh, you know, I'm doing this musical, uh, I'm taking a day off to yeah, do this damn. concert reading of, of, uh, of, the, of the new one, yeah. and, uh, you know, we get it, we, we all like, you, you're an actor, not to just do the one part, but to try a lot of different things and get yourself out there uh, doing what you love, so I will, uh, I have deeply appreciate Chicago and everything it's done for me, including introducing me to my wife and, and support me all this time. And uh, always, always that show, there's a, a full house, like coming to look at this show for how many years now? Well, wait a minute, so are you, are you currently in Chicago? As I mean, I from, from an, oh, I, I didn't, okay, so you know, people, I, I, I should have said this, people, if you want to see Ray Bahur uh, in Chicago, you, how long are you in for this, this stint? Till March 31st. March 31st, like two and a half months. Go see him, for gosh sakes. Yeah, so, come, come see me. It's great, man. We have uh, Eric Jane in it, who's an uh, absolute trip and uh, really fun in it. And, uh, you know, the great Emma Faye Wright is, is playing Velma. She's a uh, force to be reckoned with, really one of the best they've, they've had. So, And Paolo Jacques is playing Billy. Oh, yes. I got Paolo. he was in, uh, uh, was it Most Happy Fellow? What was, no, he was in uh, South Pacific, wasn't he? South Pacific, he won his Tony Corps. Right, yeah. And, uh, oh my God, so good. Such, not only, you know, everybody knows about his beautiful, beautiful, you know, voice. It's unbelievable. But also... Uh, I've been told the same about so, yeah. him. So, <laughs> he's so charming and so smart in the part. It's really fun to see. So, audiences are, are you know, since since they've joined, we were doing very well before with the brilliant uh, Charlotte D'Amboise and and uh, our other Billy's over the years. And, but right now, they're, they're really a particular quality of audience that she tends to bring, I think, and, and he brings. Oh. And uh, so it's a party in there. It's really, it's really been fun. So all the more reason to, to, to go, and, or maybe you saw it like I did uh, 15 years ago when the show opened, or how long has it it's been running now? It's, it's more. Oh, it's been 20, 23 years. 23 I years. I, I've been seeing it. I would love to see it again. Go see it again. Yeah, and, and uh, there's even this thing that it becomes Broadway week in a couple of days. If you're you a cheap Jew like me, you can save money by getting two-for-one tickets at uh, that NewYorkCityGo.com. So, so this right. is the time to go see Ray Bacord in Chicago, for God's sakes. Go see him. Amen. But don't go see it this Monday, January 20th. Now, why not? Why on January 20th at 9.30 p.m. will you be at Studio uh, at uh, 54 Below rather than right. uh, on, on Broadway in Chicago? What are you doing? I am doing a uh, concert version. We're calling it a concert, not a reading. It's a concert, uh, because that's really what it is. We're doing all, uh, most of the songs from this new musical called uh, The Glorious Death of Comrade What's-His-Name, or we frequently just call it Comrade What's-His-Name. And it's a, believe it or not, it's a hysterically funny comedy set in Stalin's brutal Soviet Union of 1928. So just my style. <laughs> very, very dark comedy. Like Chicago is a pretty dark comedy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but yeah, it's about this fellow who uh, I don't know. You can maybe think of him like a like it's a complicated episode of The Honeymooners. He's he's that kind of a husband, big oafy guy with schemes, big, and his long suffering patient wife, and uh, these these kind of old character tropes. But we're having so much fun with him. Jackie Hoffman. Uh, Jackie Hoffman. Oh my God. You know, we've been trying to get her on the, the program for ages. For some reason, she won't She won't do it. I don't know. I, uh, oh, she but hates me for some reason. She's, like no, I'll tell you what she is. is she's busy. Yeah. Um, uh, the great Madeline Doherty is stepping in uh, because uh, Jackie had a thing, but uh, oh. Jackie will come back. But uh, oh, Madeline sorry. Doherty is like, okay, oh, so but... funny. You know her, right? From producers and from all, all oh. that stuff. Now, but are you are you playing that lead? Oh, no offense, but the oafy doofy uh, fat guy. Right? I am. Oh, okay. I no am. offense, but you are. Yay. Okay. No, no, no. I know my I know my my uh, Type, my yeah. wheelhouse. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, but yeah, he he is uh, basically convinced to uh, commit suicide 
in order to spark a rebellion against Stalin. And, uh, and, and the various people who set him up to do this are kind of, he's, he, he spends the first part of the play trying to convince himself to do it, and the last part of the play trying to wriggle out of it. And it really, and you know, throughout this, his relationship with his wife and uh, what what he's putting her through, and so, and then there's a couple of shocks and surprises about who's doing what to who, and mm. uh, but, but it really is quite um, a brilliant original play that it was based on. It's called The Suicide, and it's Russian from the time period, 1928. Is it Gogol, or, or who wrote that one, or or, uh, or Dave? Erdman, Nikolai Erdman. That's right, okay, Nikolai sorry. Erdman. Yeah. And he uh, was kind of the up-and-coming beloved playwright of Russia at the time. And uh, Stanislavski, Meyerhold, all these guys adored him and said, he's the next Chekhov. And he had done one play that was successful, and then he did another one uh, that was this one. And it was in rehearsal. And Stalin found out about it. It didn't even mention Stalin. It wasn't particularly anti-authoritarian, but it mentioned the revolution and how how difficult it was for the common man, actually, and how you weren't allowed to even say that life was hard. Life was hard. And um, so that play was quite brilliant, but it was banned by Stalin. And then Erdman was thrown in uh, Siberia for 20 years. So, uh, and he was, he lived and wound up having a, 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 you know, a life of, of being a writer, but it wasn't the same. He was kind of working for the KGB uh, yeah. <laughs> because they made him they made him write their skit for entertainment and stuff like that. But uh, man, the play managed to get out and be premiered in Sweden, I think. And uh, he listened in on the phone to see how it went, and it was a rousing success. And he passed away shortly thereafter. Uh, then the RSC did a very funny. Uh, Translation of it, and with uh, Derek Jack, Derek Jackby in the role, and it was I was I'm told it was a very dark production, uh, and they brought it to Broadway for a brief time. But uh, this is uh, I think the first musicalization of it. And one thing we thought we wanted to do was kind of the original has of course a lot of uh, period references and and you know Soviet references that maybe people wouldn't get, and we wanted to make it feel a little more like a modern story and less like a if you, if you think of a Chaplin film, it tends to be, you know, those are brilliant, but they tend to have a rhythm of like, here's an excuse for this bit, and now we're moving on to an excuse where he's a waiter who's wearing roller skates, and now we're moving over here to, you know, another bit where he's running from a cop. And the story is less the way we're used to, which is one through line and you follow everything is related to that. So we, we did that and we, we, uh, we built it all into the music, and, and uh, we've been doing some readings of it uh, over the years, uh, last few years, and uh, every time we do it, people love it and want to do more. So we're getting, we're growing, and, and uh, we have a fantastic uh, team now. Of Don Stevenson's directing. He's hysterical. He did uh, all this work on both and after him, the uh, uh, of stuff, and the producers, and so on, and, uh, and has been directing comedy and he's perfect for it like he just stands up and and we all get the jokes that he's, <laughs> he's you know, that well let me ask you the, the people who are who are putting this together because you're you're the book writer or the lyric you're the lyricist for the <laughs> career. Yeah. right and are, are the other people because you were in the lame angle bmi workshop workshop right thing are they also people from that group the, the thing that was immortalized in a class act ah uh, yeah um, yes, uh, well, I met my composer at the BMI workshop, and we uh, were, uh, he's a fellow named Simon Gray, he's... Uh, no relation uh, to the English playwright, but okay, yeah. Not the, yeah, yeah, same name, but, uh, he, and he's also English, but uh, not, the, not that guy. He yeah. uh, is a, just a brilliant composer, really, really writes scene, uh, as well as good songs. You know, sometimes you see something and it's, it's the play stops, and okay. then we all listen to a song, and then the play picks up and goes again. He's, it's all effortless, I think, with him. He, he finds the right music for the moment, and then it carries and changes as the scene of the song changes. He's terrific at it, and we love each other. We work together, sit in the same room for hours and hours and hours on end. And uh, so, yeah, so I met him, and we, we found this play, and uh, we said, let's let's give it a try. And, and we, we dove in, and right from the 
from the get-go, people were like, oh yes, this character, this situation, do it, do it, do it. So BMI was where uh, we, we uh, started to incubate it and, and bring in songs and, and test them out and all that stuff. And over the years, we've, we've uh, I was just presenting, I, I didn't write it for me to be in, but I was presenting that character so often, and like, well, why teach somebody else? I'll just do it. And my wife, I'd say, come in and play Masha, my wife, in the show. And so by, by, do, and, and by doing that, you know, we kind of like realized, hey, we can do this. Let's do it. It's great for us. And well, is, I, is your wife Christine Bocour? Christine Bocour, that's right. Yeah, because I know she's in the cast. And I was going to ask, hey, there's somebody named Christine Bocour. Could she possibly be related? Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, but let me ask you this. You say that you and, and your co-writers, Simon Gray and so forth, have been working on this and, and uh, developing it for years. Is that, is that a frustrating thing of like, you have this idea, you have this firing you about this musical, you, you write a chunk of it, probably within a month or two period, and then the rest is just like developing and trying to get a reading here and trying to get a, uh, you know, a, a backer here or a thing. What is the purpose of this particular reading on Monday night? Are you, are you, is it an industry thing? Are you trying, what's the next step? Well, honestly, you always do things with that and with a little bit of that in mind, like, oh, the industry should come and see this. And, you know, maybe the next step will be, you know, for us off Broadway, uh, yeah. which, is, which is absolutely the plan. And we have all the, uh, the steps in place. And so we're moving very rapidly towards that. Are you? Okay. But, yeah. But the, yeah, the, the kind of feeling about doing this particular concert was, let's celebrate this. Let's just have uh, fun. Let's see what it's like to get all the people that we love in these roles and throw it up in that space, the 54 Below, which we adore. And it's also like we've all envisioned uh, this show. Much of the storyline takes place in a bar, in a, a uh, uh, kind of a rebel bar. And we, we thought, well, we got to have people in the audience, like, you know, drinking shots with us or vodka and, and having a good time. And I don't know if you saw this, the Sweeney Todd that was done in a, in a supposed pie shop. They could oh, no, turn it all in. You could, you, order, you could order your pies and, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. sit on the tables and, and the show happens. It kind of unfolds around you. Well, I, no, I wrong, not ironically, but uh, semi-coincidentally, like that space, when, when the roundabout took over Studio 54, they opened... Yeah cabaret there it was a henry miller's and, and they the purposely made it like a, a it was a club it was sort of a thing and they kept it with tables and yeah. chairs and like you were in the cabaret weimar exactly. experience before they turned it into more of a theater theater after that show went away exactly yeah. exactly and so 54 below was a great match for us i've always loved seeing things there the, you know whatever the food the drinks is fantastic and the way that you can really feel like you're in the room with these, the performers that are up on stage, the, the well, sound can is great there, the lighting can, is great, so we're going to have a good time there. Is, is the general public invited? In you know, other words, oh, can people listening to course. this program come see it? It's 54 Below. It's at 9.30 on yes. January 20th, which is this coming Monday. How can I get tickets yes. to this? You go to the uh, 54 Below website and uh, look for the date, January 20th. And we're there. Glorious death of Comrade, what's his name? And click on that and get your tickets. I think we're, if we're not very close to sold out, Ooh. we are sold out. But you have an exclusive, my friend. Uh, we are doing uh, an encore performance on March 2nd at 7 p.m. Mid Mazel! March 2nd. Thank you very much. So try and scoop it up, uh, whatever's remaining on, on January 20th, and then head over to March 2nd if you're unable to do that and start buying your tickets. Or, or, or scoop up the last ticket for this one, and you love it so much, you go back again on March 2nd to see it. Uh, there you go. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, it's, big, it's uh, already a big hit, and we haven't done it. <laughs> so. Speaking of a big hit, we're having a, a, a fabulous time talking with Ray Bohur. Well, we want to ask you a couple more questions before we do let you go, because you've done, um, you're, you're not known perhaps as a, a TV or film performer, but you do have some credits on like the internet movie database. We mentioned that you were in 30 Rock. You were on Flight of the Concords. What was that like? Oh my God, those guys are so funny. I, yeah. uh, I was a fan of the show, so I was a little bit, uh, what's the word, 
you know, awestruck when I, when I walked in the room, but they're just like that. They're busy. I was playing a sound engineer, and I, I, uh, it, they were in the studio, and I was on the other side of the glass uh, at the board, and, uh, you know, just being basically being a foil for them and, oh, and uh, dead, dead panning. And it was great. It was a terrific, uh, uh, it was a terrific uh, day. Well, what is your favorite? They just loved hanging out. Your favorite? IMDb credit, the one either you're most proud of or that came out the best or something that people should seek out. <laughs> or, you know, they can find it on Netflix or Hulu or something like that. Then you, you should go, oh, you know what? I did that. That was a good scene. I was in that. Oh, yeah. I did a, I had a very challenging and, and fun run in uh, uh, an episode of Third Watch. Do you remember that show, Cup Show? Um, yeah, and it was this, this uh, kind of guy with maybe some mental issues and he, he wanted to be a cop and he wound up taking a car and it got all dramatic and uh, it, that was really fun. They were very good to me and really fun to work on and it was a big challenge. So I'm proud of that third watch and then I'm proud of uh, uh, another show, Ed. Do you remember this show? It was Ed, about the a, art show on PBS? No, this was, I want to say, I should get the network right so I won't guess, but um, okay. it was, yeah, it was a show about a, a lawyer who owned a bowling alley and would take his clients into the back room of the bowling alley. But it was a funny show. And this like, show failed? Wild. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly high concept. I was like, oh, oh, I, I can just see them pitching this one. He's a lawyer a little, and a bowler. A little, it's like, <laughs> exactly. It was a little bit odd, but the whole show had a little bit of an odd sensibility. And uh, it was so uh, wonderful actress who plays the mom in... Uh, American, what is it? The Modern Family. She plays the mom in Modern Family. Oh, she yeah. was a regular on it. Yeah. And uh, Tom Cavanaugh was the lead, and, and Michael Ian Black was in it. Was oh, okay. So I got to be in that for three or four episodes, playing a uh, maybe kind of a lonely, anusish kind of character. But there was a beautiful Valentine's Day episode, and, and uh, I, I got to be in this uh, great. Great role and in the hmm. great heartwarming speech at the end of it, which was just terrific. And, so is, uh, Ed, Ed and was, I just did an episode of Blacklist with uh, yeah. James Spader, and that was amazing because he's so good, and uh, I just uh, loved watching him work and working with him. You know, you see these people on TV so much. I'm a big fan of James Spader and Boston Legal, and so now I was like, looking at him and you almost forget that you're supposed to respond because you're so used to watching him on TV. You think you're still watching TV. But <laughs> no, I get it. I understand that. So you have to realize, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm in this. I'm not just yeah. a passive spectator. <laughs> oh, I've got a line. <laughs> yeah. That's terrific. Oh my gosh. And, and, and so yeah. let me ask you, what is coming up? You know, you do have stuff lined up for March of, um, I mean, you know, March 31st is the last time we'll get to see you in Chicago. Yes. Yeah, there's a couple of irons in the fire. I can't announce anything yet, but there's a possibility uh, of, uh, of one thing. And then, of course, you know, continuing to get uh, Comrade What's-His-Name up and running uh, at an off-Broadway space as soon as possible. Oh, I'm going to be doing a reading of Douglas Carter Bean's new play. Um, yeah, at the McCarter, and it's called The Big Time. It's got a fantastic cast. Debbie Gravit is in it, and uh, Laura Osney's, and it's just a. a hey, now this bothers me. Now hold on, this this makes me a little mad, just a little tiny bit mad. I remember her. She was Deborah Shapiro. What the hell is there was this Gravit garbage? She's Shapiro. That's uh, I mean, she, yeah. She you should let her be who she wants to be, don't you think? No, well, she for a while she was Shapiro Gravit. She kept the Shapiro in the middle there. Right? Oh, and now suddenly, I don't know, there's, there's a little, there's just a little less a Jewish little there. It bothers me. It bothers well, me. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Get her on the show and ask her. Oh, I love you. Well, you'll see her. You, you, you tell, hey, there, there's this idiot rabbi I'm talking to. <laughs> he wants to get you on the program and, and uh, give you the third degree about your, thir your, your third name there. So <laughs> just a thought. Just a thought. I'm sure she'll pick up the phone and call immediately. Immediately. No, she's. She's great, boy. She, uh, she's so uh, 
the voice is nuts, but uh, oh, the, oh. the comedy is great, and it's a super fun part for her and for all I can. Well, as Douglas great. Carter being, I mean, the man is brilliantly funny, so yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and Jackie Hoffman is in that as well. Oh, again with the Jackie, everywhere, uh, all these people I'd love to have on the program, they're suddenly doing all these things. Oh, oh they can't be bothered with right. poor rabbi. I, I just, it's a, I am, I am work, honored that you, Ray Bahur, have taken the time to be with us in the neighborhood today. So I want to remind people before we ask you one last question um, that first of all, they can see you on Broadway in Chicago pretty much eight times a week playing the, the character of Amos. What, I, you know, it's been so long, I don't even remember what theater it's in. Oh, the Ambassador Theater. The Ambassador Theater on Broadway in Chicago. Now, not only do you want to do that, but this coming Monday, January 20th at 9.30 in the evening, you're going to want to go to 54 Below to see a concert staging, not a reading, but a concert version of The Glorious Death of Comrade What's-His-Name, co-written and star, co-written by and starring our new friend, Raymond Bokhur. And if you miss it that day, they're going to do it again on March 2nd as well in the um, in the same space at 54 below. So it, before we do let you go, let me ask you one more question. Uh, Raymala. I mean, may I call you Raymala? Please do. I will. Okay. Raymala, what is the best piece of acting advice that you ever got, be it from a fellow actor or a Tufts or anywhere? Best advice. Best advice. Um, I think it's that the people in the audience are the same as you, and you're there to serve them and uh, trust that they will. What's what's true for you in your heart of hearts is also true for them. That's a little bit of uh, sewing together of various uh, uh, of my mentors, but uh, that I think is it. That you're out there to kind of help them and, and to serve them, and to don't be arrogant about it. Don't be arrogant. Do your job. My, we're middle-aged Jews. If we can't be arrogant, who can? I don't know. How will it say you can be as confident as you like? Yeah, we're confident is good. You know, when I get up there and I do a sermon, I know I love stuffed cabbage. I have to feel that every single person in there that's watching me in the synagogue, they're going to love stuffed cabbage too. I have to yes, feel that way. exactly what I meant. And you, exactly my, my friends listening, remember that you will love the new musical comedy, The Glorious Death of Comrade What's-His-Name, that you can see in its early nascent form. Don't wait till it's, you know, God knows these things take years to get, I, I hope not, but, you know, it, it could take years to get this thing off Broadway or on Broadway or regionally. See it now. See it Monday at 54 Below and go see Ray Bohur either in that or both in Chicago. Raymond, Raymala, it is just uh, remains for me to thank you one more time for spending your Shabbos with me, with us in the neighborhood. I wish you much success with the show, with your parenthood, with your marriagehood, and with everything you're doing. Shalom. Thank you very much. This was a pleasure. Likewise. Shalom to you. Shalom. Bye-bye. Ray Bokhur in the neighborhood on this Saturday, January 18, 2020. 